This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It really is a pleasure to be here to talk to you guys tonight. Um, uh, as Melanie said, the, many of those things that she said I, I have accomplished. Um, and uh, But one of the, the real true passions in my life is uh, the Poison Control Center, what we do at the Poison Control Center, um, the cases that we get involved with, um, the work that we do with both the community there, um, as well as the training of residents, um, fellows, medical students, pharmacy students, we really touch on a number of different areas, and now the general public as well. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and to speak to you all uh, about some of the things that I do, um, and also to talk about mysteries from the Poison Control Center, which is a, apparently a sexy topic. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd start by just laying out a few objectives, so try to keep it simple. Um, I'm going to talk about the rich history of toxicology to begin with, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the specialty of toxicology and how it relates to the Poison Control Center, and then we're going to dive into some real cases from poison control that are, that are real mysteries. So uh, the rich history of toxicology. This here is a painting called, um, called The Trial of Socrates from uh, 399 BC. And uh, I believe that this person right here is Socrates. He went on trial in Athens. Um, and he was basically convicted and sentenced to death. Uh, and the choice of toxin for him was hemlock, um, poison hemlock, which is uh, a compound that contains conine, which is very much like nicotine. Uh, and, and so that's how, he, that's how his life ended. Um, and then you fast forward uh, a long, long time. And there's this gentleman in 1978 by the name of Georgi Markov. Does anyone know this guy, Georgi Markov? Raise your hand if you remember this guy. Well, this was a really interesting tox-related story also. He was a Bulgarian dissident. Um, and um, it's, it's tough being a dissident from Russia, because Russia doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, play any games when they don't like you. Uh, and so Apparently, he was uh, very. He spoke out a lot about his experiences in Russia, uh, and was very um, uh, kind of a controversial character because of that. And he was in an elevator one day, and, and apparently, someone just basically stabbed his leg with uh, with an umbrella. Um, and shortly thereafter, he died. Uh, and later on, what it was thought um, that happened to him was that the tip of the umbrella actually contained ricin. Um, and so he was actually poisoned by ricin. And ricin, um, you may have heard in the news, uh, it's come up at various times. I think there was a guy in Las Vegas who was trying to produce a lot of ricin a few years back. And it, it comes up all the time as a you know, sort of a, a weapon of mass destruction or mm -hmm. you know, one of these um, agents that you, you fear that uh, you know, one of the terrorists will get their, their hands on. Um, but basically, it inhibits protein synthesis, um, and it can cause death. Uh, and so that, that was, uh, that was that was uh, Georgi Markov. Then there was this guy. Does anyone remember this guy? OK, so this is getting closer to present day. This, this guy by the name of Viktor Yushchenko. And this is what he looked like you know, before 2004, uh, kind of a, you know, a, a decent looking guy. Uh, and then one day, uh, he started to get sick and feel ill. Uh, and he got this horrible looking rash on his face. Uh, and um, it turns out that he was poisoned by dioxin. Uh, and dioxins are basically what was an agent orange. Um, uh, and they, they produce uh, 
what's called chloracne, and that's what, the, that's what he has on his face here. This is something called chloracne. It's worsened by um, exposure to light. Uh, and over time, it did fade. Um, he was, uh, I believe, the uh, president of Ukraine, and this was during an election time, and I'm not sure if they ever really figured out who poisoned him. Um, but he survived his poisoning and went on um, uh, in his career. And then finally, does anyone remember this guy? Alexander Litvinenko. So uh, this was in 2006, Alexander Lit Litvinenko. I think he used to work, again, this is for uh, uh, one of the Russian um, security services, maybe a former KGB agent, something of that nature. Uh, and he spoke out uh, in some way against them. And uh, he was poisoned. Uh, they don't know when he was poisoned exactly. He ingested something. And then slowly over time, his hair began to fall out. He developed a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, a lot of the symptoms that looked like radiation poisoning um, or radiation exposure. Uh, and he ended up in the hospital. Uh, and this is him uh, in the hospital. And as you can see, he's lost all his hair. And he looks very sick. And he eventually died. And what they found in his um, blood samples and in his urine was polonium-210. Um, which is a radioactive element. And it's, not, it's very interesting because polonium-210, uh, if you're exposed on your skin, it doesn't really do anything to you. It's a, it's a, a low emitting uh, radioactive element. Um, you really have to ingest it to become poisoned. And then it poisons your bone marrow. It poisons your, your gut. Um, uh, and eventually, you can die from it, which he did. And this was very interesting, because I was reviewing this talk today, and then I was just kind of cruising around on the Los Angeles Times uh, news website. And I came across this on the front page. Um, so this is today. This is Wednesday, November 6, 20, 2013. Um, and a report has just come out that, that they exhumed Yasser Arafat's body. And uh, they have found traces of polonium-210 uh, potentially in his bones. Um, and in his decomposed body that is possibly suggestive of exposure to polonium-210 before he died. Um, so I don't know if this is, you know, life imitates art, art imitates life, but, but, but toxicology and poisoning is really, um, you can find, this is just a sampling through history of various different poisonings, but it really gets interesting when you start thinking about um, all the different types of poisonings uh, that have occurred throughout history that we, that we know of. What is medical toxicology? What do I do? Uh, medical toxicology is really a subspecialty, and it's a subspecialty of emergency medicine. Um, and what we do is we diagnose, we manage, and we prevent poisonings either from medications. Uh, and so uh, you know, commonly, we'll see patients who will present to the emergency department with overdoses of, say, Tylenol uh, or other medications that they take. Um, it may be intentional poisonings, or it may be that you know, someone double doses on their medications and comes in symptomatic. Um, but it extends beyond just me medications. It also has to do with occupational exposures. So let's say you have someone who works in a factory and makes silicon chips, and they have to use hydrofluoric acid, and they get hydrofluoric acid exposure, which causes a deep burn uh, to the skin and is treated with calcium. Uh, that's another example of something we could get involved with. Or maybe you make high-tech mirrors and you work with beryllium and you have a bunch of employees who could be exposed to beryllium, um, which can, can cause a, a granulomatous lung disease. Um, so we deal with occupational exposures as well. Uh, environmental toxins. Uh, and so an example of an environmental toxin is, is this guy down here. Does anyone know, anyone, uh, an amateur mushroom picker in the, in the audience? OK, so maybe you can tell me what, what mushroom that is. All right, he's shaking his head because a lot of, because this is the problem with being a mushroom picker. There's an old saying about mushroom pickers. There are old mushroom picture pickers, and there are bold mushroom pickers, but there are no old, bold mushroom pickers. Um, at any rate, this is Amanita phylloides. Uh, and an, am, Amanita phylloides is also known as the death cap. Uh, and essentially, if you eat an Amanita phylloides mushroom, it tastes very good, apparently. Um, but you develop liver dysfunction and failure uh, about a couple days after you start ingesting. Well, it starts maybe you know 12 hours after you ingest and progresses. And uh, every year or every other year or so, we'll get a case referred um, from 
you know, maybe the Central Valley or maybe the Sierras of a family that'll, you know, potentially go out picking mushrooms uh, and make a whole stew for the family and we'll get, you know, four patients that are transferred to UCSF um, with uh, basically liver dysfunction, liver failure, uh, maybe even requiring a liver transplant. Um, so we deal with environmental toxins and, and, and the last thing is um, biologic agents. Uh, and one common one that I can say that we deal with um, California has the highest number of wound botulism cases. Now, why would that be? Why does California have the highest number of wound botulism cases in the, in the country? Well, the reason is, is that we have a large population of, of what we call skin poppers, skin poppers who, who use uh, heroin, black tar heroin, and black tar heroin is often contaminated with botulinum spores, and we will see groups of patients come in um, who look like, for all intents and purposes, because they do, they have botulism, they have wound botulism. So we deal with biological agents as well. Um, and that's sort of the specialty of medical toxicology in a nutshell. Um, again, uh, drug overdoses. Another one I didn't mention was envenomations. I don't know if you guys know what this is. This is the blue ring octopus. We don't, fortunately, don't have any, any of those around here, but that's a, a, a venomous uh, octopus that's found in Australia. But envenomations we do see here, in particular rattlesnakes. Um, so in the southern part of the state, we have a number of rattlesnakes. We even have rattlesnakes around here up on Mount Diablo. We've seen uh, rattlesnake bites. Um, and we deal with uh, the management of patients related to that as well. Um, as I said, ingestion of foodborne or plant material or mushroom toxins, hazardous exposures to chemical products, and, and another big one is management of drug withdrawal syndromes. We see a lot at San Francisco General, Melanie will tell you, of alcohol withdrawal or opiate withdrawal, benzodiazepine withdrawal, so we see a lot of these cases as well. So that's what, that's the field of medical toxicology. Now, as Melanie mentioned, I work, I sort of have my hand in a, in a number of different pots, um, but one thing that I do is I'm the Associate Medical Director of the Poison Control Center, and as Melanie also, also mentioned, the Poison Control Center has um, four different sites in California. There's one in San Francisco, there's one in Sacramento, there's one down in Fresno, and there's one in San Diego. And this is just a map of how we sort of break up the state, and this light blue area is the region that, that, that we encompass from San Francisco sort of south to just north of Santa Barbara. Um, as time has progressed, um, we've become more of a unified sim system. Uh, and so we sort of share call with the other centers and take calls from all over California, um, including the very southern part of California and the very northern Calif part of California. So we have to be aware of sort of the regional differences of poisonings that happen in different areas of our state as well. Um, this is our little building, which is, uh, is kind of a nondescript building that you probably would just drive by and say, wow, something happens in that building. Uh, this is actually Petrero right here, and this is 25th. Um, and that's the poison control. The poison control center is right here on the second floor. Um, and then a number that you might find useful in the future, uh, or hopefully not, but you may find useful in the future, is our 1-800 number. So this is the 1-800 hotline number to, to poison control. It's 1-800-222-1222. So if you um, ever ha run into a problem uh, related to poisoning and you need some assistance, uh, feel free to call us at that number. I just want to mention one other thing related to the Poison Control Center. This is how, this is a sort of percentages of triage of patients that we get. We get, we get about, the whole system gets 300,000 calls a year. Um, uh, and uh, most of those calls, 75% of them we manage at home. And that's how we save our health care system um, dollars by keeping these patients at home so they're not crowding our emergency departments. and um, Because m many, many patients have minor exposures that can just be handled at home. We get 17% of our calls from the hospital and 8% of our calls we, we send to the hospital. So it's a much smaller proportion of calls that we get from hospitals. And um, as, part of our, as part of being the fellowship director, one of the things that I do is go and see patients in the hospital with acute poisoning when they come into San Francisco General Hospital. And so what I'm gonna do at this point is kind of shift gears away from talking about just the special, specialty and what we do at Poison Control and actually talk about some of those cases. And with a sort of emphasis of 
how it is that I or how it is that physicians think about these cases to try to come up with the answers. Um, and there is sort of a systematic way that we approach all of these cases, and I will try to sort of impart some of that knowledge upon you so that um, you can get some idea of how we think about things. So I've got three cases for you. Um, I've tried to come up with some good names for them. The first case is I Feel Blue. Uh, the second case is going to be an unusual green fluid. And the third case is just going to be a surprising case of altered mental status. So I Feel Blue. You guys probably know these guys. This is the blue man group. So here's the case. A 57-year-old man presented to a local emergency department uh, complaining of feeling lightheaded uh, with a headache and some shortness of breath and some generalized weakness. And the symptoms began about one hour prior to coming into the emergency department. And they were kind of gradual in onset. It wasn't like suddenly this patient didn't feel well. It kind of happened slowly over time. Um, sorry, I wrote she there, but he had no prior history of similar type symptoms. Um, so that's all I got for you as far as the, the history of present illness. Um, now we usually go through a series of questions about like a patient's past medical history and their medications and allergies and family history and social history and all those things we try to gather clues from to see if they have any relevance to the, to the case at all. Um, and the past medical history, this, this patient said that they had no significant past medical history, they didn't have any medical problems. They occasionally took some Tylenol for pain. Uh, they didn't have any known allergies. The family history didn't seem to be anything contributory to the case. Uh, and they denied any tobacco or alcohol use or any use of recreational drugs. So after we kind of talk to the patient and get, gather some of this information, then we then go on to do a physical exam. And the first thing that the physical exam consists of is what we call the vital signs. And the vital signs are basically, you know, what's someone's temperature, what's their heart rate, what's their pulse, what's their respiratory rate, and we usually throw in their oxygen saturation in there too. I'll describe a little bit about what an oxygen saturation is. But these are like very objective things, right? You can, you know, slap a blood pressure cuff on someone, you put a, you know, you put monitors on them, uh, you can, you know, count out someone's heart rate. Uh, these are very objective measures, and that's usually the first thing we do on a physical exam. And so on this patient's physical exam, they were afebrile. Their temperature was 97.8. Uh, they had a normal pulse. They had a normal blood pressure, 120 over 75, and a normal respiratory rate. But they had a markedly abnormal oxygen saturation. So an oxygen saturation of 72% is really low. The normal, for all of us in this room, most of us in this room, our oxygen saturations are probably somewhere around 95%, maybe between 95 and 100%. Um, and so this patient was put on some oxygen, and that oxygen saturation came up some. It came up to 85%, but it didn't go back to normal. Um, this is how we measure someone's oxygen saturation. We just, I don't know if anyone you have ever been in a hospital had this. You know, you put a little device on your finger, and that's able to measure the percent of your hemoglobin that has oxygen bound to it. I'll get into a little bit more of that in a bit. So then we go on. Uh, Another sort of strange finding in this patient, they appeared extremely, what they were described as is dusky and almost a purplish color, but they didn't appear to be in any distress, okay? So I get, got a picture here, and so this is someone's normal hand, and this is the hand of, of the patient, sort of has this bluish, maybe dusky, kind of pale appearance to it. Um, this is another example of a similar finding here, this sort of um, bluish discolor discoloration of the fingernails. So that was another prominent finding in this case, this sort of an unusual finding. We don't see it all the time. We do see it sometimes. Um, so her lips were purplish in color. Uh, and then the rest of the exam here, the lungs, there was no clear respiratory distress. They were kind of, you know, you take your stethoscope, you listen. They don't have any strider. Strider is sort of a wheezing noise when you breathe. Um, uh, an upper airway wheezing noise when you breathe. Wheezing is sort of a lower airway kind of wheezing noise when you breathe. And then crackles and ronchi are sort of different sounds that we can hear when we listen to someone's lungs. Uh, the heart exam was essentially unremarkable. It had normal sounds. The belly was soft. It wasn't distended or anything like that. And again, the extremities, there was no swelling of the extremities. 
but this patient did have, the, have this dusky appearance, appearance, which I described previously, and their neuro exam was, was essentially normal. They were able to talk. They knew where they were. They said, I'm, yes, I know I'm here at the hospital. I know the date today. You know, sort of basic questions uh, the, the, the patient was able to answer. So a lot of times what we do after we just, you know, we go through this history and we go through the past medical history and everything, we do the physical exam, usually what we'll do is we'll kind of step back and think about, okay, well, what, what do I know about this case so far? And, and I, because you kind of need a starting point. So what do we know about this patient? Well, we know this patient has lightheaded, is, feels lightheaded and has a headache. Um, and I put here, those are pretty nonspecific symptoms. And when I say you need a starting point, you kind of want to find the thing that you think is the overriding problem for the patient. Um, we certainly can come up with a big differential diagnosis for lightheadedness and headache, but it'd be really, really long list, and we'd have to like go through you know so many different diagnoses and eliminate so many different diagnoses that it might not be a useful you know spot for us to start. Shortness of breath. So this patient's also complaining of shortness of breath. That's known as dyspnea in our vocabulary, uh, and that has a pretty decent differential diagnosis as well. <coughs> Markedly abnormal oxygen saturation and blue discoloration of the skin and lips. And those two last ones um, are really what I think, when, when you look at this case, is sort of the overriding problem of this patient is that they are blue and their oxygen saturation is low. Um, and this blue discol discoloration of the skin and lips has a name, and it's called cyanosis. And um, I think that that is a good starting point for this patient, is to think about, well, how do you get cyanosis? What kinds of things cause cyanosis in a patient? Um, so again, cyanosis is a blue discoloration due to lack of oxygen. It's first visible on the lips and the tongues, uh, and lips and the tongue, and it results from the presence of deoxygenated hemoglobin, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about that more. This is not this patient, but this is a similar case of a patient who has cyanosis. And what you can see here is that when you look, you know, patients told to open their mouth, the tongue looks blue and the lips look blue. Obviously, that's not normal, okay? That's cyanosis. Now, your blood is composed of many different things. Mostly, it's composed of water and a bunch of proteins. But one of the major proteins that's in blood is this molecule called hemoglobin. You guys probably know this. Um, but hemoglobin, uh, it's Essentially, its purpose is to bind oxygen and deliver it to your tissues because you can't dissolve enough oxygen just in blood, just in water, to deliver enough to your tissues. So what your body does is it has a special protein to bind oxygen to actually deliver it to tissues, and that's hemoglobin's purpose. Hemoglobin has an iron molecule in, in four little spots on it here. There's Each of these is called a heme group, and each one has an iron molecule on it. Um, and what happens is, is when oxygen binds to these heme groups, um, it's now called oxygenated hemoglobin, and it travels through the blood and delivers that oxygen to the tissue. So it picks up oxygen in the lungs. In the lungs, oxygen binds to hemoglobin, then it travels through your blood, goes to your tissues, and delivers oxygen to your tissues. After it delivers oxygen to the tissues, when there's no longer oxygen bound to hemoglobin, it's called deoxygenated hemoglobin. So you have two forms of hemoglobin. You have it oxygenated and you have it deoxygenated. And oxygenated hemoglobin looks more red, and deoxygenated hemoglobin looks more blue, okay? So what we worry about when someone looks blue and has cyanosis is that for some reason, maybe, their, their hemoglobin doesn't have oxygen on it. Okay, and then so they, they appear more blue in color. And there could be any number of reasons why that might be, um, and that's how we start to develop a differential diagnosis. So what are, we're, we start to think, well, what are the common causes of de having deoxygenated hemoglobin in, in, your, in your blood? Well, the most common causes are either lung problems or heart problems. So if you can think about it, you need to get the oxygen into your lungs and into your blood in order to oxygenate your hemoglobin, right? So if there's any problem on the way from the oxygen in the atmosphere getting into your blood, well, that could potentially cause cyanosis. So for instance, if someone had a really constricted trachea or a really constricted windpipe and just couldn't get the air in, well, then you could develop cyanosis. Or if someone had a big infection in their lungs 
and they weren't able to get that oxygen from the lungs into the blood, that could produce cyanosis. Or if someone has really bad asthma, where they have real constriction of the small bronchioles in, in their lungs, then they can't get the oxygen into the blood. That could produce cyanosis. A pulmonary embolism, that's a clot. So a clot that might travel to your lungs and lodge in one of the art arteries in your lungs. That again, that can produce cyanosis because you can't get the oxygen into blood if the blood isn't able to flow to the lungs. And then heart problems as well. If you have heart failure, then you back up a lot of fluid into your lungs and you're not able to get that oxygen into the blood. That can also produce cyanosis. So we start generating these lists of things that can produce cyanosis. We start thinking about, well, does this patient fit any of these sort of problems that you know, we could come to a diagnosis, we can say, oh, this is more likely pneumonia, or this is, you know, this is asthma, or we think this patient has a pulmonary embolism. So what would you do next then, given all that information? Would you, who here would order a chest x-ray? Raise your hand if you would order a chest x-ray. <laughs> Well, based on what I said, you might, because if someone had a big infection in their lungs, maybe that's the reason they look blue, okay? So maybe you order a chest x-ray to see if that's the reason why this patient looks blue. They can't get oxygen into their blood because they got a big infection. Who would order some blood tests? Okay, yeah, doctors love to order blood tests, so why not? That's a safe answer. Um, who would call a doctor? I think everyone would probably call a doctor, okay. So here's what this patient's chest x-ray looks like. And I don't expect any of you to know how to read a chest x-ray, but basically what you're looking at is the heart, here are the lung, the lung fields. Um, basically, if someone has a lot of fluid or an infection in their lungs, uh, the lungs will turn sort of this whitish color because liquid, like you know, think about bloods in the heart, looks white, okay? Whereas air looks darker. So these are pretty well aerated lungs. There's no obvious you know, infiltrate, no obvious pneumonia that's there. The heart size is normal. Um, this is essentially a normal chest x-ray. So we've got this guy, so he's got, he looks blue. He has what we think is cyanosis. We think he's having a problem getting oxygen into the blood, but his lungs look normal. So that doesn't really help us, except that it does help us eliminate maybe some diagnoses, which is helpful. We can think, well, we think this is less of a pulmonary problem, and maybe, maybe this is and even maybe less of a heart problem because we don't see any evidence of a really big heart like someone might have if they have heart failure. So it's a little bit you know, perplexing to us as physicians when we see someone who has such a low oxygen saturation but has totally normal-looking lungs. Now, everyone said that they would order blood tests, and I said, yeah, doctors like blood tests. So some blood is drawn on this patient, and it looks like this blood. And maybe the, maybe the nurse doesn't quite notice it at first, or maybe in passing, the nurse says to the doctor, you know, I've drawn a lot of blood in my career, but this blood from this patient looked a little weird. Um, and what you're seeing is blood on the right is, this is what normal blood looks like, and this is some kind of abnormal blood. And if you took it out and you put it on like a little sheet of paper, and you made a little blood splat out of it, you know, this is normal looking blood on, on your left, sorry. And this is sort of the patient's looking blood, looks kind of dark and chocolatey, sort of strange. Okay, but they send the blood off to the lab, and we get something called an arterial blood gas. Um, a blood gas is helpful, helpful for us because it can measure the amount of oxygen that's dissolved inside your blood. And what they found here is that the pH of the blood is normal and the PCO2 is normal. And actually the oxygen that's dissolved in the blood is also normal. So this then becomes really perplexing for a physician. And so we got this guy. This guy looks blue. Why does he look blue? We think he looks blue because he's not getting enough oxygen into his blood. But when we actually test his blood, the oxygen that's in his blood, it's actually normal. And when we look at his chest x-ray, his chest x-ray is also normal. So w what's going on here? We've got this guy who, for all intents and purposes, looks like he's not oxygenating his blood, um, but he is oxygenating his blood. Strange case. That's why they call the toxicologist. When, it, when, it, when you have a strange case like this, then they say, hmm, maybe it's tox. Let's call the toxicologist. Again, we always like to take a step back 
and think about it again. So we're not sure what's going on. Let's think about what do we know so far? We know we got a guy who's got lightheaded, lightheadedness and a headache, pretty nonspecific. He feels short of breath. That's dyspnea. He's got a markedly abnormal oxygen saturation. He's got blue discoloration of his skin and lips, so something that we call cyanosis. He's got this weird colored blood, this chocolate colored blood, but has a normal chest x-ray with no obvious infection. So it doesn't appear to be a pulmonary cause, doesn't appear to be a problem with the lungs, and has a normal amount of oxygen dissolved in blood. Strange. Can anyone think of another problem that this could be? It's not a problem with getting the air, it's not a problem with getting the oxygen into the body, it's not a problem with the oxygen getting into the blood. What's the problem? Maybe there's actually a problem with the hemoglobin itself. There's a hemoglobin problem. Maybe the problem is that the hemoglobin can't carry the oxygen or something's going on with the hemoglobin, a budding toxicologist. There is a problem here with the hemoglobin itself. We don't see this very often. A special test, this is what they always like to say. They have, we have these competitions, and then they'll say, a diagnostic test was sent. And what was that diagnostic test? Well, in this particular case, a special test was sent to the lab that proved that this patient had an elevated level of abnormal hemoglobin called methemoglobin. Now, I don't expect any of you to really know what methemoglobin is, so I'm going to explain it to you. Remember I said you've got this hemoglobin molecule that has heme groups that bind to oxygen, and you have this iron molecule that's at the center of the hemoglobin, uh, at the uh, center of these heme groups. It's this iron you know, molecule, or this iron atom, that is actually responsible for binding oxygen. And in certain situations, that iron can be oxidized to Fe3 plus instead of Fe2 plus. So basically, you take an electron away from that iron, you make it Fe3 plus, which is not normal, and, you, and that species of hemoglobin is called methemoglobin. And unfortunately, methemoglobin does not bind oxygen very well. Now, what could do this? What kinds of things do this? Well, that's where I come into play. Toxins or drugs can do this to you. Um, and in fact, when you have this oxidized form of, he of iron, Fe3+, it changes the color of your blood from this red color to this chocolate color. Uh, it's called chocolate colored blood, and it's sort of pathognomonic for this process called methemoglobinemia. And for all of us who went to med school, uh, not mini med school, but med school, um, at some point in our careers, we probably heard this term, chocolate covered blood, but we certainly don't see it every day. And we might not even think about it right off the top of our heads. Or the nurse might not even tell you, you know, the blood on that patient looked kind of funny. So what's the treatment here? Well, the treatment is to convert that methemoglobin back into hemoglobin. And the way that's done is by giving an antidote called methylene blue. And this is like the coolest thing, because it's not often in medicine when you get to administer a drug that looks blue. So you literally put this thing into an IV, and you got this IV going into the patient, and this blue substance is being put into the patient. Uh, and that's really cool. So the patient was started on methylene blue. I'm sorry, this is not methylene, methylene blue. And within one hour of initiation of the infusions, the symptoms had dramatically improved and the, pa the patient was cured. Now again, this wasn't the patient. This is from a, a case report in the literature, but remember I showed you this picture on the left of what the patient looked like, and this is after the administration of methylene blue, the color of their skin, only a few hours later. Now if that's not a toxicologic mystery that's solved, then I don't know what is. Um, but what happened? How did this happen? How the heck does something like this happen? That's when you have to go back to the patient and start asking more questions. So, more history from the patient. The patient reported consuming part of a dried, frozen mudfish imported from Thailand and purchased at a local food store approximately two hours prior to the onset of symptoms. She cooked the fish in the oven and ate approximately a hand-sized portion. Her husband also consumed a smaller portion, and her husband felt briefly dizzy, but the, um, his symptoms had resolved spontaneously upon arrival in the emergency department. At any rate, Something in the food. When you got multiple victims, you certainly start thinking, hey, you know, do we have some kind of, a, of an outbreak going on? So this is where you just you open up a textbook and you say, OK, well, what are some of the common drugs and toxins that can produce this, that can cause this, methemoglobinemia? And here's the list. Um, it's long, 
Uh, but that's when you go back to the patient, you start asking questions about, you know, were you exposed to any of these things? So, you know, if you look at this list, there, I've got medications on the left and chemical agents on the right. Um, some of these medications are pretty rare. They're not given that often. Um, and benzocaine is a local anesthetic. We've seen cases of methemoglobinemia, for example, when a patient is undergoing endoscopy and gets a bunch of an ant local anesthetic, too much rigorously applied local anesthetic put in the back of their throat, and they've developed methemoglobinemia. So that's an iatrogenic case of methemoglobinemia. Local anesthetics, again, here. This is an anti-nausea medicine, nitroglycerin. Um, so a whole laundry list of metdapsone. This is a this is a drug that many of our patients take, um, and then you look at chemical agents. So uh, aniline dye. So if you worked in like an aniline dye factory and you tried to hurt yourself or something and drank a bunch of aniline dye, that could do it. Um, and when you look down this list, you, know, you think about okay, frozen mudfish from Thailand. Um, Nitrates or nitrites in food and well water are well described to cause methemoglobinemia. A county environmental health department officer went to the shop where the fish was sold and found many products were poorly refrigerated on the shelf and that the frozen dried mud fish that was produced in Thailand and was illegally imported by transporting it in suitcases. <clears throat> and then they took a sample of the fish um, and they took it to their lab and they found high concentrations of nitrite. Uh, and uh, this was uh, the label that they, uh, of course, the County Department of Public Health cooperated with the Food and Drug Administration. They pulled the product off the shelf, you know, all that stuff, all that jazz. This was the label. They, they sent us the frozen, dried uh, mud fish uh, label packaging. I don't see anywhere. Oh, this is probably a bunch of stuff in Thai over here. Um, and so essentially, um, that was that was the uh, the reason that this happened. Now, now, why would something have sodium nitrite in it, like a frozen mudfish? Well, it turns out that nitrites are used as preservatives. Um, actually, nitrates are typically used as preservatives, and nitrates don't cause methemoglobin the same way that nitrites do. But nitrates actually have an interesting history as well. They're also used in the manufacture of things like TNT and explosives. And um, back in the 1930s uh, during World War, or 1940s during World War II, a lot of nitrate was being, sodium nitrate, which had typically been used to um, preserve food, was being used to help support the production of arms. Um, and so for a while in the United States, uh, a small amount of sodium nitrite was being used, was at least people were allowed to use sodium nitrite to preserve food. Uh, and in one famous outbreak that occurred in New York City back in the 1940s, a bunch of people um, were poisoned with sodium nitrite that was sort of at this one, uh, it was like a, a soup kitchen kind of place where they were serving oatmeal. And sodium nitrite, which looks a lot like salt, um, had been placed in the salt shakers. And so the, 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 the patients who they got, they got 11 different patients presented in the Bowery in New York City to multiple hospitals, um, all presenting looking blue and having this problem of methemoglobinemia. Um, they had all used extra salt on their oatmeal, which contained sodium nitrite. And this was well documented in a book called 11 Blue Men and Other Narratives of Medical Detection by Burton I'm going to mispronounce his last name, but I believe it's Roche. Um, and actually, this book is the impetus for this course, The Medical Detectives. So there you go. All right, that's case number one. Let's move on to a strange green fluid. A 35-year-old man was brought to the emergency department for a bizarre behavior. According to his family, the patient stated that he wanted to kill himself. The patient was found holding a large fast food beverage cup with some residual green liquid inside. Again, OK, so we've got the history. And we go into the physical exam. You know, again, we start with the vital signs. Uh, blood pressure is a little bit high, 140 over 100. Heart rate of 80 is normal. Respiratory rate, a normal respiratory rate is around 20, maybe 18 to 20. So this is a patient who's breathing a little fast. But who knows, maybe he's just a little nervous. 
Uh, he just tried to hurt himself. He just tried to kill himself. Now he's in the emergency department. Maybe he's just feeling kind of anxious and he's breathing kind of fast. Uh, and he's afebrile. He has no temperature. I didn't include the oxygen saturation here, but I'm not going to give you another case of methemoglobinemia, so I'm going to tell you the oxygen saturation is normal. He's in no acute distress. His general appearance, he's in no acute distress. Um, uh, H-E-E-N-T, that means head, ears, eyes, nose, throat. They're all normal appearing. His lungs, again, he's breathing a little bit fast, but they're otherwise, you know, his lungs are clear. Um, his heart is unremarkable. His abdomen is soft and non-tender and it's not distended. And his extremities, he has no edema and they're normal in color. And then Neuro, he's kind of slurring his speech. If you get him up and walk him, he's a little bit ataxic. He kind of seems like he's drunk. Maybe he is drunk, I don't know. So again, what do we, what, what do we have here that's, that's abnormal? We have kind of a fast respiratory rate and a guy who appears drunk who just consumes something in a beverage cup that looks green. Maybe it's Mountain Dew, I don't know. All right. So what should we do? Anyone want a chest x-ray? No. <laughs> should we get some blood? Yes, doctors like blood. We should, we should definitely get some blood on this patient. Um, should we x-ray the patient's stomach? Eh, I don't think that's going to help that much. We probably won't be able to see what's in there. Maybe we should ask the patient what he drank. That's a good idea, actually. But unfortunately, oftentimes, especially when they've tried to hurt themselves, they're not so forthcoming with that information. But that, and that would defeat the, defeat the purpose of this whole exercise. So we can't ask the patient what he drank. We can, but he won't tell us. How about we test the residual in the empty cup? Well, that's a, that's a good thought. but. It would take a long time to, to try to figure out what the patient drank by sending that to the lab and trying to figure out you know, what exactly is this stuff. Uh, that could take, who knows, maybe days to try to figure it out that way. So what do we do? Well, we do what all good doctors do. We stick a, an IV in the patient, and we start giving them some fluids. And we like to take some blood. So we draw you know, an arterial blood gas again, which I described to you in the previous case. We check some glucose. We check some electrolytes. We check their kidney function. We get an alcohol level on them. Maybe he just drank a bunch of alcohol. After all, he looks drunk. Um, we get a Tylenol level on them. We get Tylenol levels on all these patients because anyone who tries to hurt themselves, if you ingest Tylenol and you present to the uh, emergency department, you basically look normal. You, you, you don't have any symptoms. And it's something that we can easily treat. So anyone who tries to hurt themselves, we always send a Tylenol level on them because sometimes, even though they don't tell us they took Tylenol in the history, they've actually ingested Tylenol. And if we find an elevated Tylenol level, we can actually treat them. So we check a Tylenol level on the patient also. Hey, we, st we stick a urinary catheter in the patient and actually look, send the urine off uh, for urinalysis as well. Um, we get an EKG, and we put them on a cardiac monitor. Well, the first blood test to come back, and the first one always to come back is, is the ABG. And what we find is that the patient has a very low pH. Okay, this, you, you probably can't appreciate this because you know, 7.01 seems pretty close to 7.4, which is normal, so how low could that be, really? This is really low, okay? Your body tries to maintain a pH that's 7.4 within, you know, a very close range. So a deviation of this much, this is a patient who has what we call acidosis. They have too much acid in their blood. PCO2, that's a measure of the dissolved PCO2 in the blood. That's a little low. PO2 is normal at 93. And then you get something called a lactate on the um, ABG as well. And this is just another sort of marker in your blood um, that we can sometimes use to come up with various diagnoses. And I'll show you how we, can, how we use that in this particular case. You also got some electrolytes. I'm not giving you all of them. But the bicarb, OK, so bicarb is a buffer in your blood. OK, if you have a big acidosis, um, then your bicarb will be very low. And in this case, your bicarb is seven, it's very low. Your bicarb should be 24, okay? So a bicarb of seven is very low, again, suggesting a severe acidosis. And the creatinine, creatinine is a measure of your renal function, of your kidneys, okay? So um, as your creatinine goes up, that means that your kidney function is going down. And so this patient's Kidney function is OK, but it's a little bit high. One and a half is a little bit high compared to the normal range, which would probably be you know, 0 0.8 to maybe 1.2. So 1.5 is a little bit high. So the interpretation of at least these initial labs is that this patient has a severe metabolic acidosis. 
I'm going to sort of put that in red, a severe metabolic acidosis with possible, maybe there's a little bit of early renal failure going on. So again, this is when you've, got, you've gathered some information, you kind of want to take a step back and think about what are the salient features of this case and how do I move forward? So what do we know so far about this patient? Well, we know this was a suicide attempt, number one. So there's the definite possibility of self-harm here. We know that there's some green liquid. Well, we can't start our differential diagnosis with green liquid because, first of all, I don't even know what textbook to look that up in, number one. And number two, there's probably a list of a gazillion things that look green that this could possibly be. So we can't start there. Severe metabolic acidosis and early renal failure, though, these are things that, that that's a starting point for us because that's the overriding theme to this patient. This patient has a severe metabolic acidosis. So then we can think about, okay, what are the things that cause severe metabolic acidosis? And this is what you learn in medical school, is how to figure out what things cause severe metabolic acidosis. And you can go to a table that looks at what are the most common causes of severe metabolic acidosis. So just look at the top line here. You can basically divide severe metabolic acidosis into four different categories, okay? Lactate, so lactate is an acid, lactic acid. So if your lactate is really high in your blood, you get an acidosis. There are many, many, many different things that cause a lactic acidosis. This list you can see is long, and this isn't even the whole list, okay? But it's a long list. So one thing that really can help you out in a case is if you have a guy who has a severe metabolic acidosis, but a normal lactate. Because then you can just eliminate all those things on the list and move on to the rest of the list, which may be smaller. Okay, ketones is another very common category. Ketones or keto acids cause metabolic acidosis. And one of the most common things that we see that causes ketoacidosis is called diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's when you have a diabetic, poorly controlled, whose sugar gets out of control, they start to develop ketones, they get a severe acidosis, and they get really sick. We see that all the time. So if we can measure ketones on the patient, and they're positive or they're negative, we may be able to you know, eliminate these, these the diabetic ketoacidosis. There's also something called alcoholic ketoacidosis or starvation ketosis, which is similar. Patients who drink alcohol every day, uh, they become malnourished, they don't get a lot of calories from other places, can develop alcoholic ketoacidosis. Another thing that can cause acidosis, severe acidosis, is, some, is renal failure. If you have really bad renal failure, but not acute renal failure, it's not like your kidneys just go, go out today and you suddenly develop severe acidosis. It's usually someone who has renal failure over the course of an extended period of time. That can also cause a severe acidosis. And then there's this category of toxins or toxic alcohols. Uh, which include methanol and ethylene glycol, which also can cause severe acidosis. And they cause it because they're metabolites, not the alcohol itself, but the way the body metabolizes these alcohols, they metabolize them into acids, which then make you become really acidotic. So if we go back and we look at this patient's labs, maybe we can start to eliminate some of these things. So the first thing we see is that the lactate is only three. Now that's slightly elevated, but that's not elevated enough to explain why this patient has a very bad metabolic acidosis. So we can go back to our list and we can basically say, let's just eliminate that category of lactate. This is not a lactic acidosis. So all these things that cause a lactic acidosis, we're pretty sure that's not what's causing this patient's lactic acidosis. What about um, ketones? So what, what happened here? Sorry, I think I went backwards. Well, I'm just gonna tell you I think I lost a slide there, but the ketones in this patient are also normal. So we measure serum ketones on this patient, and the serum ketones are also normal. So we can eliminate that from the differential diagnosis as well. I think that I just had this slide out, um, uh, out of order. So serum ketones are negative. So the lactate's low and the serum ketones are negative. So we can eliminate that whole category from the differential diagnosis. What we also can eliminate from the differential diagnosis is renal failure, because even though the creatinine is a little bit elevated, it's not very high. And again, like I said, acute renal failure doesn't really cause the kind of acidosis that you see here. It's really more chronic renal insufficiency, renal failure that causes this. So we can eliminate that as well, which leaves us with two possibilities left, methanol and ethylene glycol. So what is methanol? 
Methanol is, a, is an alcohol. Uh, it's used as a solvent. Um, uh, you could buy it uh, in any store, pretty much. What's that? <laughs> Yeah, you you could you can you can it's pretty easily accessible. One thing about methanol though is it, it really tastes horrible and it can be caustic. So when you ingest methanol, it really gives you a lot of irritation of your esophagus and your and your stomach. It's kind of a it's not a very pal palatable um, uh, substance. Now another source of methanol is have you ever heard of something called pruno? <laughs> so in jail, when when uh, patients decide that they want to make their own alcohol. Um, they can sometimes uh, just put a bunch of stuff together in a bag and try to ferment it and they make this stuff called pruno and sometimes it can be contaminated with methanol as can things like moonshine that's made illegally in the south etc so occasionally we'll see outbreaks of methanol poisoning from people who are home brewing uh, alcohols and then ethylene glycol what's ethylene glycol antifreeze. ethylene glycol is antifreeze uh, so Few more bits of information come in about this patient. So we look at the patient's urine, okay, under a microscope, and we find these interesting little crystals. And these are called calcium oxalate crystals. Um, so they have sort of this rhomboid shape. Um, these are called calcium oxalate crystals. And then someone decides that it would be a good idea to take this patient's urine and put it in a kidney basin and flash a woods lamp on it. A woods lamp is a black light. Okay, so like, you know, when you go to a, you know, into a room with black light and you have a white shirt on, it just kind of like bright, gets really bright. So here's the patient's urine on the left and here's the control patient on the right, uh, or the control, not the control patient. So they just put some water in a kidney basin over here and this is the patient's urine on the right here. So the urine is just totally lighting up, like it has some substance in it that's allowing it to light up. So what do you think this is? So again, let's back to what we know. It's a suicide attempt. It's a green liquid. It's a severe metabolic acidosis that has normal lactate and no ketones. And as I showed you, that narrows your differential diagnosis pretty significantly. The patient has early renal failure, calcium oxalate crystals in the urine, and their urine's fluorescing. So what's the diagnosis here? This patient ingested antifreeze. Uh, and here's antifreeze. It's a, it's a green liquid. Um, it's uh, the patient has a serum ethylene glycol, because ethylene glycol is what's the component of antifreeze, is 180 milligrams per deciliter. What's normal level of antifreeze in your blood? Zero. Zero. Okay. I'm glad we all, <laughs> glad we all know that. Um, now, why would it fluoresce? Why would the patient's urine fluoresce? Is that kind of weird? Like, you know. Well, it turns out that more expensive antifreezes have fluorescein in them. And why they have fluorescein in them is so that when you have a leak underneath your car and the, the antifreeze is coming out, a mechanic can get under there and shine a black light and actually see where the leak is coming from. So some antifreezes have fluorescein in them. And fluorescein, when you get it under a woods lamp, fluoresces and it becomes really bright. And so, but not all antifreeze has that. So, that's, uh, while that can be a diagnostic test, just if, if you fluoresce someone's urine and it doesn't fluoresce, if you shine the light on it and it doesn't fluoresce, it doesn't mean that they didn't ingest ethylene glycol. So why does all this happen? Well, I'm just gonna show you briefly what your body does with ethylene glycol. It converts ethylene glycol into these intermediate products, glycolate, glyoxalate, oxalate, and then all of these are then eliminated in the urine. And it turns out that ethylene glycol in itself isn't really is not really toxic. It's like an alcohol. It makes you look like this patient, kind of bizarre behavior, maybe a little bit, you know, looking like I'm drunk, just like I had drank a, lot, a bunch of alcohol. Um, so this is not the part that is toxic. What gives you the acidosis is all these byproducts. These are acids, oxalic acid, oxalate, uh, you know, gly, gly, glyox, oxalate is, uh, is also an acid. So when all of these build up in your body, that's how you get the severe metabolic acidosis. And then these are eventually transported to the kidney, and it turns out that in, the, in your urine, you can form these calcium oxalate crystals, and this oxalate and glyoxalate can also cause damage to your kidneys, which is why the renal function is a little bit affected as well. So you get severe acidosis, you get renal dysfunction, and if you don't treat this patient, they will go into severe acidosis, and eventually develops renal failure, uh, and they'll get really, really sick. 
So what do you think the strategy is to treat this patient? There's two strategies, two things you can do. One thing you can do is you can actually just block this right here. Just prevent the ethylene glycol from converting into these toxic metabolites, and eventually this ethylene glycol will go away. And how do you do that? Well, it turns out that if you give someone alcohol, or if you give them something called femepazole, we don't really give alcohol anymore, but you could, that alcohol will prefer preferentially be converted in a, under normal pathway down in this direction, and it actually blocks ethylene glycol from being converted into its toxic metabolites. So that's actually pretty cool. So let's say you're out in the middle of nowhere, and your friend just drank a bunch of ethylene glycol. <laughs> just get your 40 ounce out of your bag and you know, hand it to him and say, here, guzzle this you know, vodka, whatever you want. Um, and that'll actually prevent the toxicity of ethylene glycol. Um, we give Femepazole because it's easier to do. Could you imagine us you know, sitting in the hospital? Here, here's your bottle of vodka. Just drink this down, and you're going to get better. The other way that we solve this problem is by a process known as dialysis. So we can remove this alcohol by dialysis. And dialysis is just a process where you take all the blood out of someone, you clear it of the toxin, and then you put it back in. Uh, that's what dialysis is uh, in a nutshell. So the answer to case number two is ethylene glycol toxicity. All right. I know there's probably questions, but just hang on to them, write them down, and then at the end, we can talk about them. All right, last one. This is kind of a short one. A surprising cause of altered mental status. So a 57-year-old male with a history of diazepam abuse. Do you know what diazepam is? Valium. Valium. Okay. So this guy's got a history of diazepam abuse. He presents after he was found down on the street unresponsive. His initial Glasgow coma score, have you ever heard that term, GCS? Probably saw it on TV or something like that. GCS in the field was noted to be 11. Just real brief. What we do is we look at a patient. We look at, you know, are their eyes open or closed? Do they, are they speaking normally? Do they, can they answer their cell phone? Can they, can they, uh, can they, uh, are they moving, are they moving all their extremities normally? And if someone can do all those things, they have a GCS of 15. And if someone is doing absolutely nothing, they're just lying there, their GCS is three. Okay, there's no score of zero in the GCS scale for whatever reason. So anyway, this guy's got a GCS of 11. It's kind of in that in-between area. Uh, in the emergency department, he, that's supposed to be, is somnolent and difficult to arouse uh, and is unable to provide any medical history. His GCS is still 11. Okay. Well, we go on. We want to get some other information. Unfortunately, since he's essentially altered, we can't get any of this information. All we know about him is that he uses diazepam. We don't know if he has any allergies. We don't know what his family history is like. Um, we do know that he has a history of recreational drug abuse. And then we go on to his physical exam. So again, his vital signs, his blood pressure is a little bit high. 159 over 96 is high. His pulse rate is normal. His respiratory rate is essentially normal. His O2 sat is normal, and his temperature, uh, his temperature is normal as well. He's got no evidence of any trauma, so it doesn't look like anyone like kicked him in the head and you know, beat him up or something like that. He has no track marks. What are track marks? Like if someone uses IV drugs, they might ha actually have little track marks over their veins that are suggestive of, of IV drug use. Um, his pupils are four. That's pretty normal. And they're reactive bilateral. That means they're kind of working. Um, his lungs sound clear. He's got normal heart sounds. His abdomen is soft and non-tender. It's not distended. He's, got, he's a little sweaty. We call that diaphoresis. We like to come up with fancy words for simple things. So he's a little diaphoretic. That just means he's sweating a little bit. He's got no cyanosis. It's not another case of methemoglobinemia or edema. And he's somnolent on his neuro exam. And he's difficult to arouse. He doesn't really co cooperate with a comprehensive exam. But he, and, but he doesn't have what we call focal neuro deficit. So it's not like he's not moving one side of his body like someone who had a stroke or um, has what we call cranial nerve findings where there's some, something weird going on, like asymmetry of the face or something like that. So again, we take a step back. What do we know about this guy? Well, he's got altered mental status. He's got a history of diazepam use. Maybe he just took too much diazepam, right? Maybe he just like took a bottle of Valium, and now he's just unconscious because he took a bottle of Valium. He was found on the street. He's got no track marks. Maybe that goes against something like using heroin. Um, he's got high blood pressure, and he's a little bit sweaty. 
So we have to start somewhere. You know, we have to, we have to start somewhere to develop a differential diagnosis. What's the overriding problem that this patient has? And we start there. So the overriding problem that this patient has in my mind is that he has altered mental status. And physicians, at least some physicians, really love mnemonics. Mnemonics um, can sometimes give you lists of diagnoses that you should think about if someone has a particular condition. And one that I like, because this comes up so frequently in my work, San Francisco General Hospital, this is like a dime a dozen. We get probably five or six of these patients a day with altered mental status. And I'm trying to think, well, what caused their altered mental status is this mnemonic atomic. And what, what a mnemonic is is basically each letter corresponds to a particular diagnosis. So what's A, alcohol? So maybe you know this guy's altered because he just drank a lot of alcohol. That's a possibility. T stands for a number of things, but one is toxins. Maybe he's ingested some toxin that we don't know about. Temperature, so patients who are hypothermic or hyperthermic can develop altered mental status, but we know that's not the case here because the patient isn't hypothermic or hyperthermic uh, as we saw on their uh, vital signs. Trauma, you know, so if someone gets beat up and they've got a big you know, intracranial bleed, they've got like a you know, big amount of blood building up in their brain because they got hit over the head with a crowbar or something like that, um, that can cause altered mental status. But again, you know, this patient doesn't really have any evidence of trauma to suggest that that's the reason he's altered. Oxygen, so if someone has low oxygen levels, that can also cause altered mental status. But again, this patient you know, has a normal oxygen saturation, doesn't really fit um, metabolic. Metabolic is this big category. There's lots of electrolytes that you have in your body, like sodium. And if sodium is high or if sodium is low, it can give you altered mental status. Another big one is glucose. Like if your glucose, the sugar in your blood gets really low. I don't know if any of you have any, ever seen one, seen someone who's gotten really low glucose, but they can become, they can kind of look like anything. They can be really somnolent. They could even have a seizure. They can become really altered. So glucose is another one that we think about there. Infections, so if someone has like meningitis, you know, they may present with altered mental status. Typically they'll have other symptoms. They might have a fever or something else that's suggestive of menin meningitis. They might have a stiff neck or might be complaining of like that light over there is so bright in my eyes. Um, so infection is a possibility. And then carbon monoxide I just throw in there because I'm a toxicologist and I like to talk about things that are tox related. But carbon monoxide exposures can also give altered mental status and we as physicians often don't think about it that much. So this is a nice starting point, you know, and it also gives you some context for, you know, what kinds of tests you might order. Like you might order an alcohol level or you might perform a CT scan of someone's head if you think that they have bleeding in their brain that's causing their altered mental status. And you're gonna check you know, their electrolytes. You're gonna send off all their electrolytes to look to see if they have a problem with their sodium or their glucose or their calcium or something like that. Um, you might do something to look for an infection. You know, if, so if you think someone has meningitis, you might stick a needle in their back and take out some fluid from around their spine to see if it's infected. So it gives you some context for some of the tests that you might then order. And you can start to eliminate things. Like I said, this is probably not an issue with temperature since his temperature is normal. It doesn't really look like he's had trauma. We know his oxygen's normal. You know, some of these other things we may not be able to completely exclude. But what a physician will do next is say, well, what do I think is most likely on this list? You know, well, maybe I think most likely it's alcohol or some drug because he uses a lot of Valium and I just think that maybe he just overdosed on Valium. And to start ranking the possibilities from most likely to least likely and ordering tests accordingly to what we think is the most likely diagnosis. So the next thing we're gonna do is gather more information. So who wants to send blood? <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to send blood, yes, good. Taught you that doctors like to send tests. They like to send blood. So we send his blood and this is what his electrolytes look like. I didn't put the normal values in this one. I'm just going to tell you. Normal, 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 not normal, OK? So your normal glucose in the fasting state at, at minimum is going to be 70. A glucose of 23, and that's in usually milligrams per deciliter, is very abnormal. So this patient has hypoglycemia. And like I said, hypoglycemia can present in a number of different ways. It could present as a seizure. It could just present um, uh, as someone who's really agitated. Sometimes patients get diaphoretic if they've got really low blood sugar. 
So what would you do? I think you all could treat this patient. What would you do for this patient once you saw this? You'd give them some sugar, right? Great. So that's what we do. The patient is given 50 grams of glucose um, with complete resolution of his altered mental status. Sorry for the typo. And when questioned further, he states that he has no history of diabetes, he, and he only takes diazepam daily for back pain. And he states that he has never had any symptoms or any problems with his blood glucose levels. Sort of strange, huh? So here we got this guy. He doesn't have diabetes. He doesn't take any medications other than diazepam, which is, I can tell you is not known to cause hypoglycemia. So why does this patient have a low blood glucose? Sort of a strange conundrum. What drugs do you know that are associated with low blood glucose? OK, so everyone knows insulin, right? Insulin is what diabetics take. You know, when you have high blood sugar, you take insulin. How do, does anyone know how insulin is administered? Do you take a pill? No. Injections. You have to take injections because it's not, it can't be absorbed when you take a pill. You know, they've been working on that for a long time, a pill of insulin that you could take. You know, that'd be much nicer than having to give yourself injections all the time. But the guy doesn't it, it, it describe anyone coming up to him and suddenly injecting him with something and running away. But maybe he did it to himself, right? Maybe, maybe he's a, you know, a case of Munchausen's and he's trying to you know, hurt himself. And he really did give, him a, give himself an injection of insulin. And that's what's going on. Not sure. What other drugs do you know of that can cause low blood sugar? Any, you know, anyone know of any? Well, there are all the other drugs that diabetics take that, um, that lower your blood sugar over time. You know, a big class of drugs is called sulfonylureas. You know, and you, may, you may recognize the name. Is, one of them is gliburide or gliburide. Um, uh, these are drugs that can lower your blood glucose. Um, but there are many other drugs, too. And of course, it has to be a long list. And here's the list of, of some drugs that can commonly cause drugs and other toxins that can commonly cause low blood glucose. But the common ones that we see that we think about are insulin and sulfonylureas. That's the gliburides. Some of these other ones you can think about. Alcohol is an interesting one. You know, in patients who are really malnourished and they don't have a lot of good, you know, what we call glycogen stores and the ability to produce glucose when they're fasting, they often will develop hypoglycemia. Um, Aki fruit, this is just a strange one. It's a Jamaican fruit that can produce, has a substance in it that can produce hypoglycemia. Um, and some of these other ones can also produce hypoglycemia. So what happens to our patient? Well, one hour later, the patient becomes somnolent again. And a repeat check of his glucose comes back at 35. So it's low again, strange. His glucose is low again. He's given an additional 50 grams of glucose with resolution of his symptoms. And when questioned further, he reports that when he, ran out of, he, when he runs out of his diazepam, he sometimes buys it from a friend on the street. That's a problem. You don't really want to buy <laughs> drugs, even if they're any drugs, but even pharmaceuticals from friends on the street. Because when you're buying Valium on the street, which of these pills do you want? Do you want these or do you want these? I don't know. <laughs> Unless I know what Z3925 is, or what does that say? C O or C R123 is, I don't know which drug I should buy, and neither did the patient. Because one of these is diazepam, and the other one is gliburide, which is, looks exactly the same as diazepam, but is actually a drug that lowers your blood glucose. So this patient accidentally bought gliburide on the street instead of his usual diazepam and developed hypoglycemia. Now, how do we treat this patient? Well, it's pretty easy to treat them. We basically give them sugar and keep them in the hospital for a while, and eventually the drug clears from their system and they get better. At any rate, that was my last case. And I just want to remind you about the California Poison Control Center and this hotline, this public hotline. Um, we're open 24-7 if you have any issues related to poisonings. We're happy to take your calls and to advise you uh, and to help you through any kind of poisoning situation, 1-800-222-1222. And with that, I will take up all your, take your pent up questions. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna try to remember to repeat the questions that you ask so that everyone can hear them. So I got one here. So the question is, is in the first patient, so the first patient was, um, 
was, was the one that had met hemoglobinemia, um, was carbon monoxide a consideration? Well, that's an interesting thought. It turns out that when carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, um, it actually doesn't turn blue. It actually turns more red. Uh, and so cyanosis is not a common finding in carbon monoxide poisoning. And actually, it's a strange thing, too, that when carbon monoxide binds to oxygen and produces something called, called carboxyhemoglobin, when you put that little detector on someone's finger, it actually thinks that carbon, uh, carboxyhemoglobin is actually oxygenated hemoglobin. So when you put that little detector on someone who's exposed to carbon monoxide, it actually reads normal. It doesn't read low. Um, so even though you might think of carbon monoxide in that situation, it's not really consistent with the diagnosis of carbon monoxide. So that's the answer to that question. Sure, over here. So the question is, what would have happened to patient number one had he not been treated? That's a, a little bit of a tough one to answer. You certainly can die if your met hemoglobin level gets high enough. Um, and there's no telling, you know, I didn't give you an exact value for how high that patient's met hemoglobin level was, but typically we end up treating patients when they become significantly symptomatic, when their met hemoglobin levels get greater than somewhere around 20%. Um, because if they're not treated, they, they, can, they can actually die. Um, they can get other things as well. They can get hemolysis where their red blood cells actually break open um, and they can get sicker from that as well. And so typically a patient like that who's that symptomatic would get therapy. That's not to say that the natural history or the natural course over time would be that that patient just gets better anyway, but there is the possibility of that patient getting significantly worse. So we, we would de generally treat them. So the question is, so why did that patient get sick but everyone else who ingested it didn't? And the answer probably is because they didn't need enough of it. So that patient was probably exposed to more of it than anyone else. But if you recall, there were other people who did feel ill, they just didn't feel as ill and they didn't turn blue. So there's various degrees to which you can develop methemoglobinemia and the exposure, certainly the amount that you're exposed to is gonna uh, is gonna drive that, is gonna affect that. And then there are also some people who are probably more susceptible to developing methemoglobinemia than other people. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, other questions? So we've got a bunch in the back, striped shirt. So this is unrelated to these cases, but the question is, is it, if you get bit by a rattlesnake, what should you do? Uh, should you call the poison control center? and then go directly to the hospital, or should you just call the poison control center? Should you just go to the hospital? Okay, For, I'll answer that question by saying what you should not do. Okay, what you should not do is any of the following. Take a knife, cut the wound, suck out the venom, <laughs> use a tourniquet, you know, put a tourniquet on your arm, uh, hook yourself up to a, a car battery and try to electrocute your arm, put your arm in ice, you know, uh, believe it or not, all of these things are described as uh, things that people do after they've been bit by a rattlesnake. What you should do is get yourself to the emergency department as quickly as possible. If you can immobilize your limb um, sort of at the level of the heart, uh, that's also a good thing. But obviously, if you got bit on the leg, you know, in order to get to the emergency department, you have to walk on it. But, but, uh, but the answer is to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. And the reason for that is that we have very good treatments for rattlesnakes. Uh, we have very good anti-venom that we can give you to treat rattlesnake bites. And the quicker you get that anti-venom, the better you're going to do. So you should just get yourself to the emergency department as quickly as possible. And should you call poison control? Poison control is probably just going to tell you, go to the hospital as quickly as possible. So if you think you got bit by a rattlesnake, don't do any of those things. Don't grab the rattlesnake and you know, put it in a bag and bring it with you. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, uh, don't do any of that. Just, just, just go to get yourself to the hospital. You should know that you know, rattlesnake bites can be fatal, but they are rarely fatal. We don't have the kind of snakes that they have in Australia, fortunately, and in Southeast Asia, um, where you got you know, bites that'll kill you in you know, less than 20 minutes. Um, these are things that happen over time. Rattlesnakes, you know, that kind of a bite happens over time. You have time to get yourself to an emergency department. OK. There were some other questions in the back over here. So in the very back, striped shirt. The question is, um, 
ibuprofen and Bactrim, common medications causing uh, meningitis. Uh, I don't, you know, there are some medications that might be able to cause what we what we would call call kind of like an aseptic meningitis. So that's like a meningitis where um, uh, you don't actually have a bacterial infection or a viral infection. It's actually some kind of reaction to the drug. I don't know specifically offhand all of the medications that could that could do that. I would say it's a less common cause of meningitis, but I'm I wouldn't. I don't really pretend to know the, know a full. I can't really. I'm not prepared to give you a full answer about the you know all the medicines that might be able to do that. Question here, and the question is, do I ever encounter any cases of botulism related to home canning? And um, <clears throat> certainly, the Poison Center has taken calls related to home canning. That is one of the classic ways in which botulism. Uh, is uh, or botulism spores can germinate is under that scenario. Um, the, there are different kinds of botulism. The kind of botulism that we're talking about in, in home canning is where you've trapped the spores inside of an anaerobic environment such as a can and then they germinate in there and they produce botulinum toxin. And then when you open the can and you actually eat whatever's in the can, you are now eating the toxin, and the toxin affects you. Um, it's pretty rare. Uh, we see more cases of wound botulism. Wound botulism is different because you inject the spores into your body, and then they germinate in your body. So you have an active infection of, of botulism producing the toxin in your body. So in that case, you need to actually, you know, usually IND and abscess and give antibiotics and all that stuff. But so the answer to your question is that we do occasionally see cases like that. Um, and botulism is on the list of another of you know sort of bioterrorism agents. It would take a very small amount of botulism to uh, to affect a very large uh, group of of people. Um, uh, so we talk about it a lot um, as a as sort of a problem agent. Question. The question is that uh, in my presentation there were a lot of tables that included a lot of different. Um, uh, lists of conditions uh, that could be related to a particular presentation. And the questions are, um, how are they organized? And um, how are they made available to physicians? And the answer is, that's become easier over time because we all walk around with you know, one of these phones that has you know, an application on it that where I can just look up you know, causes of dyspnea, causes of cyanosis, and kind of peruse the list. But um, if it was as easy as that, then anyone could be a doctor, right? So um, you, really, you really have to um, have some of that knowledge in your, just hardwired into your brain. And a lot of what I'm sort of expressing and explaining here comes from experience and pattern recognition. So, you know, we see the same patterns over and over and over again. And we've gone to those tables and learned about them. And over time, it sort of becomes second nature. We kind of have this gestalt of, you know, I've seen this before, and this looks like asthma, or this looks like meningitis. I saw this once. I know, I know this pattern. This pattern is X, whatever it is. And so we don't necessarily have to run to the table to look at it. Where we run into problems is when it, it, may, fit the pat, it may fit the pattern that we're used to, but it's a little bit different. And it's not quite, it doesn't quite fit, but we think it fits. So we go down this road of, I know that what this is, I've seen this one before, but it's the zebra or it's the outlier, it's the other one that you know, we didn't quite think about. That's where, that's where physicians can run into problems and make errors. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I hope it does. But um, we, we have all this information easily accessible now in the electronic age. It's just a matter of, uh, it's not just having it available, it's knowing when to actually look for it and, and what to look for. And also how to interact with your patient, you know. Uh, that's also a big part of it. So this side of the room, I have a question. So the question is on something like salmonella or E. coli, or e. coli how does one trace that to the source, right? Is that your question? Yeah, because sometimes it's something. Yeah. Um, well, the, 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 the answer to that is that we don't do that at Poison Control. We have special um, people whose life it is to figure, 
to figure that out. And they're epidemiologists, and they usually work for the state health department. And um, what they do is they figure out exactly where that came from by looking at all the cases and try trying to trace it back. You know, what are the commonalities between all the people who have presented with similar symptoms? They do a very, you know, sort of detailed analysis of each case, and they try to do detective work to, to work backwards um, to try to figure it out. That would probably be an interesting one for, a, for another mini medical school is sort of the sleuthing of how to figure out, um, you know, the source of a particular infection. Do you get calls from people who have? We, we yeah, yeah, we do, we, we do, and whether or not we recognize it is also an important point. So, you know, we are one input into the, system, into the public health system, and we have been at the forefront of sort of um, exposing certain outbreaks, not necessarily salmonella or E. coli, um, but other things, you know, other um, poisoning events. Uh, for example, uh, there was many years ago uh, an, an outbreak of carbamate poisoning in watermelons that occurred in and around uh, the July 4th holiday, where we got a bunch of calls at poison control of symptoms of carbamate poisoning, which is like salivation, lacrimation, uh, you know, paralysis. And we, we were able to synthesize that information because we do have a computer system and we do have ways that we can sort of tag cases that, um, that may uh, may have public health uh, consequences or significance. Um, and so we were able to sort of share that information with the Department of Public Health to then uncover uh, you know, an outbreak of something. And that's a good point, is that we need to find ways to integrate our systems a little bit better so that you know, the CDC is, is working with us and the state health departments are working with us so that when we get these little signals, these little you know, uh, of what may be the beginning of some outbreak, whatever it may be, that we're able to t identify them earlier. And there are people who are working on, on trying to do that. Sorry, right here. Uh, the question is, what are the most common poisonings in children? And what are the best methods for, uh, for uh, prevention, I guess, poisoning prevention? I had, would have to look at this data a little bit closer. I would say that we see a lot of um, uh, sort of household, you know, products, you know, exposures, um, most of them benign um, in children. Uh, occasionally we see kids getting into parents' medications or grandparents' medications. And as far as prevention relating to those, um, a lot of it has to do with education of parents and educating, uh, basically educating them of how to, how to keep those kinds of things safe and away from their kids, how to childproof your home, um, how to keep medications safe and away from uh, uh, children, um, because those are the kinds of ways that kids get into trouble for the most part. Um, so I hope that answers your question. The question is, is syrup of Ipecac and charcoal tablets, are, are they still in vogue and still the best thing to have around? Um, so syrup of Ipecac, for those who don't know, uh, is an agent that when you give it to someone, about 30 minutes after you give it to them, they vomit. So it's a, it induces emesis, um, induces vomiting. Uh, syrup of Ipecac used to be a real common uh, sort of thing that you might have around your house just in case your child or someone uh, got into something that was poisonous and uh, you wanted to you know, make them vomit whatever that substance is up. The problem is, is that uh, there's sort of like no way to shut it off. So once you give someone syrup of Ipecac, they're going to vomit. Uh, and um, you don't know what's going to happen in that 30 minutes between when the child ingested what they ingested and when they're going to begin vomiting. Um, so what if the child becomes really, really somnolent and they become really drowsy and somnolent between the time that you gave them the Ipecac and the time they begin vomiting. Now you have a patient or a kid um, who's totally just you know, out of it and is vomiting. And that's a bad combination because they can aspirate and they can get sicker from that. Not to mention that there's a lot of retching induced by syrup of Ipecac and 
Um, there, there can be complications from that. People can, you know, rupture their esophagus or, you know, get a tear in their esophagus. Uh, and so it's been quite some time now since the American Academy of, Academy of Pediatrics um, basically said we don't support syrup of Ipecac anymore. We don't, uh, we don't think that the, the benefits outweigh the risks of that therapy. Um, I don't remember exactly when they came out with a statement related to that, but it's been probably 10 years since they came out and said that. And we don't really use it anymore. We don't recommend its use um, uh, because most of the studies show that it doesn't really provide much benefit to patients. Maybe there would be some kind of rare situation where a patient was like, you know, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere with no other therapy available, no way to get to the hospital, um, and they've just ingested something that has like no antidote and is lethal um, that, that we would suggest giving Ipecac, but we haven't been recommending that for a long time now. As far as charcoal is concerned, I don't know about the charcoal tablets. Um, it's common, I, I actually haven't looked into charcoal tablets all that much. It, commonly what we give is, uh, is a charcoal slurry um, it's like 50 grams of charcoal. It's in like a bottle. Uh, sometimes the EMS folks will give it to patients. And even with charcoal, there are some questions about do the benefits really outweigh the risks? And you think about, well, what are the risks of charcoal? Well, what the risks of charcoal basically are is if someone develops uh, vomiting and they have charcoal uh, in their stomach and they start vomiting charcoal, if they aspirate charcoal, uh, it can cause a bad, you know, pulmonary, uh, what we call pneumonitis, irritation of your of your lungs. Um, so we, we're more careful about charcoal too now. We don't just indiscriminately give charcoal to every patient who shows up with an overdose, but it's still something that we think about giving to patients who um, who ingest something toxic that we want to try to prevent from being absorbed. So Ipecac, no charcoal is on a sort of case by case basis. And the other thing that people used to do is. Uh, something called like, you know, pumping the stomach. And you've probably heard of that where you stick like a, you know, gastric tube into someone and pump everything out of the stomach. We don't really do that much anymore either. There are some rare situations when we might do that, but uh, that's really fallen out of favor as well. Question up front. So the question is if someone has ingested herbal supplements and they're now unconscious or unable to provide you any history, um, how do we go about um, treating those patients? Is that is that the question? Um, well, this is a, you know, a tremendous um, problem. Uh, <clears throat> even if the patient is conscious, a lot of times with herbal supplements, uh, they may be Chinese herbs. Uh, they may come in little baggies that you know, have Chinese characters on them or you know, no English at all. And we have no idea what, what's actually in them. I mean, we, 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 we can't determine it. Um, uh, we have no way of figuring that out in a timely manner. Um, so even if someone is conscious and able to tell us that they took this supplement or that supplement, um, you know, some of them we know, you know, some of them you could buy in a GNC or um, <clears throat> we, most of, most of those are, are relatively non-toxic, but there are some that are, that are toxic. But if you don't know, you're sort of stuck, right? And so you go off of, you know, how is the patient presenting? Um, what sort of symptoms do they have? Uh, you know, some of these um, dietary supplements can cause cardiac problems. Uh, we'll look at EKGs and see are they having, you know, some kinds of uh, findings on their EKG that's consistent with a particular herbal. But we're really kind of flying in the dark when that happens, and, and there's not a whole lot that we can do about that. Um, uh, we sort of fall back on, well, we treat them with really good supportive care, and um, we hope that we can get them through whatever it is that's going on. Um, if they're exhibiting some signs and symptoms that we think are specific to a particular dietary supplement or toxin, then we might treat them for that. But, but we're often stuck when that happens. It's, it's not an easy situation. Well, anyway, um, I really appreciate your, your time. Um, and I hope you found it useful.